We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of Breaker Morant on October 1st, 1980. It was written by Jonathan Hardy, David Stevens, and Bruce Beersford, adapted from the play of the same title by Kenneth G. Ross, with additional materials from Kit Denton's novel, The Breaker, but not really, and story editing from Harold Lander, directed by Bruce Beersford, and released by Roadshow Film Distributors. In 1901, Harry Breaker Morant was an Anglo-Australian military officer in the Second Anglo-Boer War. He was arrested and charged with the execution and murders of various prisoners during the conflict. The story of this film was first committed to the page in the form of the novel Scapegoats of the Empire, which, together with Kenneth G. Ross's 1978 stage play of the events, inspired this film. The screenwriters received an Academy Award nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay, or Best Writing Screenplay Based on Material from Another Medium, as it was known at the time. <laughs> That's excessive. A novel by Kit Denton entitled The Breaker had been first published in 1973 and for a reissue during the film's production added the words soon to be made into a major film to the cover of the book, despite not having been used at all in the film's research. The publishers were taken to court and lost, eventually destroying all copies with the incriminating blurb, but for a later reissue took the even more brazen step of using a photo of actor Edward Woodward what? who plays Breaker in the film on the cover. Really? Though it takes place in South Africa, it was shot in South Australia, which somehow marked the first time a film was produced in Australia that took place outside Australia. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Sure. Jack Thompson won the first ever Best Supporting Actor Award at the Cannes Film Festival for his performance. Apparently, Ronald Reagan considers this one of his favorites. Uh, just to go back for a moment, I, I was thinking when I was watching the movie, what an interesting landscape south africa had because i don't really recall ever seeing uh film footage of south africa before but now i just realized that it was just interesting because it was australia well they're actually very similar are they yeah because uh, mad max fury road was shot in south africa oh okay and it looks exactly like the landscape from the first two mad max movies or sure. i guess the second and third the hills they have and the trees that they had just looked really kind of unique and unusual and i thought oh okay that's what south africa looks like but yeah. now i have to i have to Make Rethink adjustments that. in your brain. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you guys have heard it lately, but the trailer for Breaker Morant, for some reason, has the, the James Horner score from Battle Beyond the Stars behind it. That's awesome, though. Which, I guess it's kind of a multi-purpose score, but uh, I, I wouldn't expect it to go behind like a period historical drama, but um, it's there. We start with uh, some words. Words yeah. appear on the screen. We have to read first, and then we can watch. The Boer War, 1899 to 1902 was fought between countries of the British Empire and the Boer, mostly Dutch, population of South Africa. The issues were complex, but basically the Boers wished to retain their independence from England. By 1901, British forces uneasily occupied most Boer territory, but had difficulty winning an outright victory because of mobile Boer guerrilla forces. It was like one of those things where it says, there's a lot of complex issues, but basically, like I was like, yeah. that's a weird way of phrasing it in the opening crawl. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, it'd be like, it was a time of civil war. It was like, but basically, Darth Vader, bad, Luke, good. Yeah. If, <laughs> it's like, if you if you want to boil it down that much, just do that. You don't have to be like, look, there's a bunch of information I'm leaving out. But yeah. stay with me. Good guys, bad guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it, is, it is strange to have but basically in there because it sounds like that's not directly from the opening crawl, which it is. I was also a little confused, and I'm not much of a history buff, and I, I needed a little bit of explanation here. But, you know, my understanding of the history of South Africa, so we're having two different imperialist countries fighting right. over this yeah. land. But, but one got there a lot earlier. 
yes, I understand that one had had established residency before the other, but neither of these guys are natives. I was like, oh, so we're not actually fighting any natives here. Right. We start the film with a brass band performing in a village center under a gazebo, and a title tells us this is Petersburg, Transvaal, South Africa, November of 1901. We drift away from the band to a courthouse where Morant and his co-defendants are making a closing statement at the end of the trial that this whole film will be about. Uh, the title title for the movie is Breaker Morant, but in the text on the screen, it has Breaker apostrophe than Morant. And I was like, is, is it Breaker Morant? Like he is the the one of the breakers, so he's breaker Uh They just call him the breaker, but it was weird to see it breaker apostrophe. I didn't even Morant. notice the apostrophe. And I also didn't like that while they were showing names up on the screen, when the actor uh, Woodward, uh, Edward Woodward, yeah, stands up to give his name, you know, Harry Morant, they put another name next to him, and it's not his name. Yeah, and I was like, that that's bad timing yeah like because <laughs> like it's that's like not... that frustrating tendency of movie posters to put like the three names are offset so that no one's name is above them yeah exactly because they one gets top billing yeah uh then put the pictures in that way uh but i thought it was like a just a bad uh text timing choice to, yeah. to, to have him stand up and then have the name appear next to him like oh this is the guy who's playing harry morant it's like no nope. that's, no that's, that's, that's a different guy a different guy we'll see him in a second Morant tells the story of his enlisting and eventual assignment to the Bushveld Carboneers. At the close of his statement, Morant takes full responsibility for the events at Fort Edward, but reminds the court that he was acting under orders and was also deeply disturbed by what happened to Captain Hunt. We cut from here to Hunt's fate, a pre-dawn raid on a small boar encampment. At the start, there are no horses or visible people, and they question the intelligence that led them here. The boars are said to be weak and sitting ducks. As the men approach, they're suddenly fired upon, in self-defense, by a hidden squadron of boars. Captain Hunt is wounded but left behind in the standoff as the carboneers retreat. As the carboneers return to their stronghold, Morant does a silent head count and recognizes Hunt is missing. He turns to Captain Taylor and curses his useless intelligence report. Eight boars exhausted, that's what you said. Horses with fever, you said. What do you say now? I say avenge, Captain Hunt. We cut back to the present, where Morant, Hancock, and Witten are being released from their cells and escorted to Lieutenant Colonel Denny's office. The men are informed that the decision has been handed down, that they will proceed with the court-martial here at Petersburg. We cut to Lord Kitchener's headquarters in Pretoria, Transvaal. Major Bolton is here to meet with Lord Kitchener and Colonel Hamilton. When he's led to Kitchener's office, he unstraps his helmet, but Jesse thought the guy was about to pull his mustache off. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, when he walks in, he had that look about him, like, I'm in disguise and I'm going to peel off my mustache now. (laughs) Or or if it's one of those, like, really, like, uptight British ceremonial things, like a wig in Parliament, but this is... You have to remove this. You have have a mustache. No mustaches in this office. (laughs) Take that thing off your face. <laughs> and take that ridiculous thing off. <laughs> <laughs> Bolton is being assigned as the prosecuting attorney in the upcoming court-martial trial. Hamilton asks how familiar he is with the Bushveld Carboneers and reminds him that they are mostly Australian. Bolton takes it a step too far, complimenting their effectiveness, when Hamilton pushes back, mentioning, We've just arrested three of them for shooting Boer prisoners and a German missionary. The Germans have lodged a complaint about these actions, and it is in the interest of England that Germany not be given any excuse to prop up the Boers in this conflict. Kitchener tells Bolton that the Germans don't really give a damn about the Boers. Needless to say, the Germans couldn't give a damn about the Boers. It's the diamonds and gold of South Africa they're interested in. They lack our altruism, sir. (laughs) That's definitely (laughs) why they're here. Uh, As though there were many other reasons that Britain has insinuated herself in the region. They give Bolton the report on the preliminary inquiry and send him on his way. In the washroom, Witten tells Morant and Hancock that he enlisted because he believes in the Empire. He never believed a court-martial could even happen to him. Morant says that he's here because he needs the money. The men meet their attorney, Major Thomas, though right off the bat he admits to his relative inexperience. He also tells them that he only got the paperwork on their case yesterday and the trial begins tomorrow and that he's never dealt with a court-martial case 
because he was a country town solicitor. I handled land conveyancing and wills. <laughs> and then one of the guys says, yeah. wills might come in handy yeah. <laughs> because he's pretty sure they're all going to die. But clearly they're being set up to fail here. Right. Mm-hmm. It sounds like Hancock has already decided they aren't surviving this trial. Witten asks Thomas if it's more likely that they'll be imprisoned or cashiered because he worries what his father will think and must be relieved to learn from Thomas here that this case involves several murder charges and the penalty would be death. Like, oh, good, I don't have to deal with my dad afterwards. (laughs) That night, Thomas attends a dinner with Denny and Bolton. A man sings a song in Dutch. There's not really a lot of purpose to the scene other than to show that the people running this trial are on good terms with each other outside of the courtroom. Yeah, and but also I think it was they were entertaining Dutch ladies and right. the fact that they they wheel this guy in probably under threat to sing us a song, will you? And yeah. and the ladies seem very upset about him singing cuz he's probably singing a very sad song in Dutch. But they don't know none of them speak it, so they yeah. don't know. Uh but uh it's like you know, it's like it's almost it's, a, it's akin from like do a dance for us. You know, it's it's yeah. just like you're you basically are our slave. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's kind of an upsetting scene. Yeah. But uh, it doesn't doesn't really advance the plot. It's just to show that that they're terrible people. Yeah. On their way to the trial, Thomas is trying to collect last minute information from the men to be as informed as possible. He's also dropping paperwork, and the men roll their eyes at the lawyer they've been assigned. I think this is a little weird and out of character because, and maybe they were trying to make it a progression, but I don't think they make it obvious enough that it's a progression because he seems, he seems like adult at the beginning. Like he's, I think that's the the point was to to make it look like, oh, you guys are fucked. They set you up with an idiot, and he's going to come in and be stupid, and you're going to lose right away. Yeah, but then, but but when the switch happens, it's it's like a switch. It's yeah. just instant. But I think it's just he needed to get up to speed. Is all. I guess, but I mean, he he self admittedly isn't a professional at this type of case. Right, that is true. Immediately as the trial begins, Thomas requests an adjournment, as the prosecution has had six weeks to prepare for this, and he's being forced to essentially improvise a defense. His request is summarily rejected, setting a tone. Thomas then declares the trial unconstitutional, as the defendants, at least two of them, are Australian and can only be tried by the Australian Army thanks to Australia's fresh independence. Denny corrects him that they were serving in the Bushveld Carboneers, a unit under British command, though interestingly, this trial actually caused the drafting of a law that Australian military officers, regardless of command, cannot be court-martialed by anyone outside the Australian army. Oh, interesting. Denny enumerates the charges against them, murder of a Boer prisoner named Visser, murders of six other unnamed prisoners, and a German missionary, Reverend Hess. They all plead not guilty. Bolton calls Mr. Donald Robertson as his first witness. Robertson reports that discipline was impossible with the Carboneers, especially with the Australians. After a few more complaints about Australians in general, Thomas objects as to the relevance when two of the three defendants weren't even at the camp with Robertson. The prosecuting attorney says he's just trying to establish the reputation of the Carboneers and the objection is overruled. Robertson finally levels a specific accusation at a defendant. I had to reprimand Hancock here for what I considered to be a serious breach of the rules of war. And what was that? He placed prisoners of war in open wagons in front of train engines. They could have been shot at by their own sight. Thomas moves to cross-examine and asks the charge of this newly established division. The commanders had to live off the land, use hit-and-run tactics. Surprise attacks, that sort of thing. The Boers did it, so it was the only way we could fight back. Thomas points out how, if they are face-to-face with new tactics, it stands to reason they'd be using new tactics to fight back. Thomas asks why Hancock put prisoners in open wagons before the trains, and Robertson says he thought it might stop them from mining the tracks. Thomas asks if it worked, and Robertson has to admit that it did, but goes on the defensive, suggesting that that's no way to treat prisoners, and Thomas asks what Robertson's policy with prisoners was before this. He points to a large number of prisoners being taken and very few being appropriately incarcerated, suggesting that his humane alternative to dissuading terrorism was to just shoot the prisoners outright. Now it's Bolton's turn to object as to the relevance of Robertson's alleged crimes, 
and Thomas leans on establishing the credibility or lack of credibility of the witness, but the objection is sustained. Lastly, he asks if they ever stopped the practice of putting prisoners in wagons in front of trains, and Robertson admits no. They haven't. They're still doing it Yep, because it works. Could it have been that the practice, though irregular, was effective in controlling Boer attacks? Up until now, Thomas has been played up as a bit of an oaf, hastily shuffling through his paperwork and asking the men the same questions multiple times. Only now, as he excuses Robertson from the stand, do they realize they have a badass attorney. Yeah. And Hancock moves to shake his hand as Robertson sheepishly exits the court. The next witness, Drummond, gives his own account of the events leading to the execution of the Boer prisoner Visser. We flash back to when Hunt's body was recovered and Morant sees it. He's horrified. We learn later that it's clear from the body that Hunt was intentionally tortured alive. There were bullet wounds in his shoulders and legs only. Morant collects a group of men to follow the Boers that did this. Someone points out that they have a couple days head start in any direction, but Morant knows exactly where they would have gone. They'll have gone to the Waterberg. Where else can they go? They find the encampment with a few hours to nightfall and charge the Boers. One in particular is wearing Hunt's jacket. Many are killed, and the one in Hunt's jacket is taken prisoner alone. Morant screams at the prisoner, Visser, while Visser denies killing Hunt. Morant orders him executed immediately. The men put up a short resistance, but eventually decide, meh, fine. <laughs> well, he'll never get to heaven if he doesn't die. Even their translator, a Boer turncoat, begs for the opportunity to be a part of the firing squad. Back at the trial, Drummond insists the man wasn't given a fair trial. Thomas cross-examines and opens by pointing out that all Boers caught wearing khaki were ordered shot by higher-ups. Denny runs interference by claiming that Kitchener's order about khakis only applies if they're worn in an effort to deceive. Thomas asks if Morant and Hancock were popular and effective leaders when compared to Robertson and Drummond has no choice but to admit that they were. Thomas also points out that he was reprimanded by Morant and Hancock for stealing cattle himself. Hancock and Drummond start shouting back and forth until Denny says, Control yourself, Mr. Hancock, or you'll find yourself in serious trouble. <laughs> you find that amusing? Well, I was just wondering how much more serious things could be. Bolton's next witness is the translator. The translator lies to save his own skin, that Morant threatened to kill the prisoner himself if a firing squad couldn't be assembled. He also denies having volunteered to take part, knowing that if this information were to escape the room, that his countrymen would not take it lightly. Bolton asks if Visser's trial was anything like this one, and then suggests, without a hint of irony, that Visser's trial was totally different because the decks were stacked against him and his death was decided before the trial had even begun. Bolton questions Morant about Hunt's death and their relationship. Evidently, Morant was engaged to Hunt's sister. Bolton suggests that because Morant was not there for Hunt's death, he can't possibly know if Visser was responsible. Or, more to the point, how he died. Right. I guess he's claiming he was mutilated in it's a like fair fight. It's like in Brubaker. Fight. It's like, oh, maybe they were chopped in half later mm. or by the, when the boxes collapsed. I mean, I think that they're right in in that they they he did it was circumstantial you know that he was deciding that th this guy was guilty of anything right um so they're not wrong in what they're accusing him of right but he had orders to kill this guy and then he asked his people to carry it out he didn't have explicit orders to kill this guy he was told to kill all the boars that were caught wearing khaki officer khaki yes okay so he did have so i don't know how he they they don't harp on that more in the trial Denny because denny just says oh well the, only if they're wearing it to trick you not if you already know that they're right a but then try to make a case that they were trying to trick them like that i think that is your yeah. your your best out in this case because they he is guilty of the other things that they're saying right yeah. but when he has drummond on the stand drummond is like oh well i think he was wearing it because it was cold and that was just something that they had come across i don't think yeah and it's they like, are ill-equipped so i mean that right that is that stands to reason too. and then you can't argue against it but uh when he says oh it's only if it was to deceive then hancock also says no one ever told us that the only order we got was to kill them if they were wearing khaki right denny asks how professionally visser's trial was carried out and morant says it wasn't as handsome as this one he says we caught them and we shot them under rule 303 which is a reference to the caliber of the bullets they were using on the field 
We applied Rule 303. We caught them, and we shot them under Rule 303. Thomas comes to meet them in their cell that night and asks them to stop shouting angry things in court because it's already rigged against them and they shouldn't make it worse. He tosses them alcohol after confirming with the guard that he didn't see it happen. As your eyesight, Sergeant. Very weak, sir. Morant reads them a morose bit of poetry and Witten tells them he isn't ready to die. The next day the band is playing under the gazebo again and the turncoat translator is catching evil glares in every direction. A gunshot rings out and the band stops playing for probably less than five seconds and then we see the translator dead in the street before they strike back into their song. I wasn't super clear on who killed him. I think some bore force that was in the town killed him Mm -hmm. because they're having to employ locals for the smaller jobs like they specifically show a shot of one of the like natives of this area doing all the typing of the trial right right And so i think the point is that this is a leaky courtroom and word got out that he was working with them and so he got shot Oh, okay. I didn't realize that it wasn't known that he was the turncoat. I thought he was being shot because of some testimony he gave in court, like specifically saying he didn't uh, shoot the guy. And there was people who were, uh, you know, on 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 these guys, on, on, on Breaker Morant's side, you know, it's like, hey, he's lying. Shoot him. I think someone in the court could see the obvious fact that he was lying about that and that he actually did participate in this firing squad. And so that that got outside of the courtroom and so someone's like oh we got to kill that guy because oh because he might change his testimony well no no, just because they knew that he was a a turncoat and they were like oh he's actually killing our own people now fuck this guy yeah thomas questions taylor in court he asks if taylor knew of the orders to shoot boar prisoners and we cut back to some random day during the conflict when a bunch of prisoners were led back to camp with hunt morant tells him six of the boars surrendered and Hunt just says, God, Harry, got no facilities for prisoners, can't even feed them. Hunt orders them shot, and his men carry out the order. Morant tells Hunt that he thought the kill on sight order applied only to prisoners caught wearing khaki, and Hunt cites new orders from Kitchener. Here's where I have to start interjecting with my own thoughts, because what they're doing is wrong here, killing these prisoners, and no amount of inserts of these guys looking reluctant will change my opinion that they probably deserve the death penalty. I guess it was another 40 years before I was just following orders was recognized as a shitty excuse to murder innocent people. But I really don't care if these guys get a fair trial because they're clearly shitty people. Yeah, I mean, that's this whole this whole movie is kind of like that. They want you to be sympathetic towards these guys, but it's like, oh, it's rigged against them. It's like, "Eh, fuck them. I don't care. I don't care that the people above them are worse. Like someone should die for this terrible shit that they did. Yeah, I mean, it is super shitty that they were given these orders and they followed them and now they're facing the consequences for them but those orders were wrong bolton interrupts to point out that though they claim to have been following orders they never saw anything in writing from kitchener himself apparently suggesting that every soldier should refuse every order on the battlefield until he has a personal copy of the order on file when taylor points out that the order was relayed by hunt bolton reminds the court that hunt is dead essentially accusing them of lying But if they just killed these prisoners in front of Hunt against his orders, wouldn't he have reported that? Like, clearly he told them to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because otherwise they wouldn't have done it. And if they did it and he didn't tell them to do it, he would have sent word. Yeah. Bolton more directly accuses Taylor of lying by asking if he is also soon to be on trial and if it were not in his best interest to confirm the orders that prisoners were to be shot. I suppose it could appear that way. That night, the three defendants have visions of their home lives before they were sent to war. Witten's father toasts to his wartime adventure. Hancock tells his wife that he's not much of a letter writer and that any letter is probably bad news. Morant is seen singing a song to his fiancée about maybe coming back. Maybe that I'll come back, dear God. At last, at last to you. The next morning, Boers attack Petersburg. 
The lookout was successfully distracted by a Boer woman, and a long line of Boer horsemen attacked the city and courthouse. The defendants are released from their cells and armed to help fend off the attack and manage to repel the Boer forces, almost single-handedly. Yeah. Like they get this machine gun up, and they're just tearing through all these guys out in the middle of the yeah. courtyard. In court later, Thomas reminds them that it's standard policy to offer a pardon to soldiers who perform duty of honor and trust after knowledge of military offense. And Denny says, oh, that's irrelevant. It's like, what? No. No, that's very <laughs> relevant. To, it's very relevant. It's supposed to get a pardon for the what they did today. Denny says that they will now move on to discuss the next set of six prisoners killed. And we cut back to a group of six boars approaching with white flags. Morant recognizes them as a part of the group that killed Hunt, and Taylor orders them executed. Witten raises an objection, but they shout him down, just like they did last time, with Visser, because they like killing people because they're kind of awful. This is a war, not a debutante's ball. There's no rules here. Witten tells Hancock Morant wants a firing squad, but reminds him that what they're doing is wrong, and Hancock doesn't care. To bolster this point, he shows Witten some dumb dumb bullets that he got off of the boars, and he explains these bullets would make a neat little hole in the front of your forehead and then take the whole back clean off, as though a dead person gives a shit what their cranial exit wound looks like. A missionary man named Hess pulls into the camp and asks after the prisoners. Morant tells him not to worry and not to talk to them either. Witten pulls Morant aside and says, Harry, you never gave a damn for orders if you didn't agree with them. You're just doing this to avenge Captain Hunt. You are probably right, lad. It won't bring him back, but it's the next best thing. What an asshole. Morant sees Hess talking to the prisoners against his strict instructions. Hess says they asked for him to pray for them, so he had no choice. They line up the prisoners to execute them, and Witten turns away disgusted when one charges him full speed, tackling him to the ground. Witten is able to shoot the man while they're rolling around. And back in court, Thomas intends to prove that there were orders to shoot the prisoners. Do you, Major Thomas? Denny claims Bolton has proven there weren't orders, but neither side has any proof of any argument. Thomas requests Lord Kitchener to appear as a witness and settle the matter once and for all. As the attorney for the defense, he's allowed to invite whichever witness he chooses so long as they relate directly to the case. And obviously this guy issuing this order right. is important. Mm-hmm. But he's mysteriously missing. Yeah. Denny is personally insulted that Thomas would even suggest that Kitchener would issue such a barbaric order, and Thomas reads off a laundry list of all the barbaric shit they're already doing all the time. Are you suggesting that the most senior soldier in the British Army, a man venerated throughout the world, would be capable of issuing an order of such barbarity? I don't know, sir. But I do know that orders that one would consider barbarous have already been issued in this war. Before I was asked to defend these men, I spent some months burning Boer farmhouses, destroying their- Bolton urges Thomas to drop the request for Kitchener's testimony, as the case will fall apart when Kitchener lies on the stand. Kitchener vents to Hamilton back at his home, and Hamilton explains that Thomas is putting up an unexpectedly good defense, and it's too late to send any more of their defenders to India, as they've done with anyone else who might have testified on their behalf. Kitchener basically admits that the defendants haven't done anything wrong, but sacrificing them can end the conflict, and so that justifies the means. Small price to pay? I quite agree, sir. Though I doubt the Australians shared our enthusiasm. Kitchener orders Hamilton to attend the trial in his place. What should I say? I think you know what to say, basically putting all the responsibility on Hamilton to lie or tell the truth and deal with the consequences. We cut to a close-up of Hamilton being sworn in, and he looks legitimately frightened to swear on a Bible before lying to the court. Thomas's first question is very straightforward. You had a conversation with him regarding Boer prisoners. Do you recall that conversation? I have no recollection whatever. So Hamilton has decided on the I forget defense, so popular <laughs> these days. Thomas suggests that Hamilton's testimony should be ruled inadmissible as it's irrelevant whether or not the conversation took place because even witnesses for the prosecution have confirmed that the order was given from Hunt to Morant. The next day, on his way to the courtroom, the man standing guard at the door pulls Thomas aside to share some words he heard from today's witness over a pint. Now they will deal with the death of the missionary, Hess, the final of the three charges. 
Bolton questions Corporal Sharp. He asks whether Sharp saw the deceased that day, and apparently Sharp doesn't know what deceased means. Mm -hmm. Bad start. He testifies that a half hour after Hess left the camp, Hancock followed with a rifle. Bolton tries leading the witnesses a bit until Thomas calls him on it, and he uselessly rewrites the question. Uh, did, did he look like he was agitated? Agitated? Yes. Yes, that's it. So, yes, sir, he looked agitated. Objection, Major Bolton is leading the witness. I will rephrase the question, sir. Tell me, Corporal Sharp, how did Lieutenant Hancock look? Agitated, sir. Thank you. Sharp tries to leave when Bolton is done, but Thomas sits him back down. He asks why Sharp left the Carboneers before asking Sharp to confirm he was transferred away as punishment for theft. He then asks if Sharp has, as of late, been making threats on Lieutenant Hancock's life in public, and Sharp admits that he has. Bolton questions Morant and asks, wouldn't it have been in your best interest to stop Hess before he could report the deaths of the prisoners at your order? And Morant points out, apparently not, because <laughs> he was stopped, and I'm still here facing murder charges. Further, Morant testifies that he sent word of his actions to Colonel Hall, and that as a result, he would have no motive to kill Hess. When Bolton calls BS, Morant suggests dragging Hall back from India where they sent him away so he couldn't testify here. The next day, Hancock is put on the stand to explain where he went that day, and he confesses to intimate encounters with two separate Boer women and presents letters confirming his visits to each woman. Denny is very upset that an officer in the British Army would participate in something as ethically questionable as consensual sex, as opposed to something dignified like, say, ordered genocide. Back at their cells later, Hancock confesses to Witten that he killed Hess, in addition to having the lots of sex. <laughs> like, he literally just had sex with these women so he would have an excuse yeah. when it came to... I think it was purely coincidental. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, Witten is understandably upset, but oh well. <laughs> yeah. Morant has to talk Witten through it and explains that Hess was an enemy combatant in a missionary's clothes. We flash back to Hancock shooting Hess in his wagon from an admirable distance. <laughs> yeah. I also feel like it's a little odd that if you are going to shoot him, you just leave all that evidence out there. Like, I know that you shot him from far away, and you probably don't want to get closer because somebody might come upon you yeah. doing something you shouldn't be doing. But I think that it's going to be really obvious when somebody comes across a horse and carriage and and dead guy, dead yeah. missionary on, With on the road. With a bullet in his head, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, they did mention that it's a dangerous path right? and that anything can happen. Mm. Uh, anyone can get shot no matter what. But nothing what. was taken from the wagon, so yeah. what would be the other motive of killing him? In his closing statement, Thomas reminds the jury that the commandos are a new type of enemy requiring a new type of engagement, and that at the very least it can hardly be argued that Witten was not simply following orders. He goes on to suggest that war changes the nature of men, and the tragedy of war is not that the atrocities are committed by abnormal men, but normal ones in abnormal situations. Soldiers at war cannot be judged by civilian rules. Thomas argues that if crimes committed in battle against a guerrilla enemy were prosecuted the same as peacetime violence, that court martials like this would be in permanent session. But I disagree. I think when the word gets out that you get the death penalty for following up on unethical orders, people will stop following those orders and the world would get slightly better. If you're well, like, they're definitely going to think twice about following the orders, but as the... Uh, people who run the military, you should probably be concerned that you are yeah. setting a bad example for, you know, anybody ever listening to you ever again. Right, because if you say, oh, go kill all those unarmed people because we don't have any beds for them to stay in, and you go, how would this sound in a courtroom later if yeah. I went along with that order yeah. and I didn't have proof that it was given to me? Yeah. Uh, so I think that a lot of this is coming down, it's, it's basically boiling down to a concept of I don't believe in these orders or I don't believe that these orders are ethical or correct. I can either choose to disobey them and get court-martialed and possibly executed for right. disobeying a direct order from my superior officer, or I could carry out these horribly unethical and terrible orders that I've been given. And still potentially yeah. be and killed. Yeah, it's like, what is your damned if you do and damned if you don't? Yeah. Well, and, and I think there was a line even at one point um, in... What's his name? It's not Kirchner. Kit Kitchener. 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 In Kitchener's office where they, you know, he said, I warned you against mm -hmm. the possibility or court-martialing, you know, men during the time of war for 
you know for murder for murder because and you're setting a terrible precedent yeah it, well yeah it's super dangerous they're 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 not going to have anybody volunteer to enlist if, right. if this is how they're going to treat their their officers which is why they're trying to lean really hard on the fact that these guys are australians mm-hmm. that they're like these aren't these aren't our soldiers our soldiers are well behaved these men are clearly disobeying orders no one told them to do these things and they did them and they're terrible because australians are just terrible as we all know and that they're trying to stress it that way yeah. so that they don't have to deal with problems from their own soldiers yeah like i said it's shitty what they're doing to these guys but these guys are also technically guilty of all the charges mm-hmm. they yeah. killed all of these people that they said they, they killed and every step of the way someone was there telling them hey Maybe don't do this because it's wrong and terrible. And they said, I don't care. I'm mad because they killed my friend. Yeah. Who, by the way, died attacking their own stronghold Yeah. by cover of night. So it's like, yeah, no, that guy deserved to die because he was invading them. And you guys shouldn't have done all this terrible stuff. That night over drinks, Morant recites a Byron poem about their inevitable deaths, which Hancock follows with a limerick about Australians. Hey, the was a man. Australia, who painted his ass like a day. The colour was fine, like wise to design, but the aroma, ooh, that was a failure. <laughs> Thomas brings them champagne from two members of the four-man jury as celebration for being acquitted on the charge of having killed the Reverend Hess. They drink a toast to freedom, Australia, horses, and women. Taylor pulls Morant aside to say, don't count on this. You guys are probably still fucked. He tells Morant that he can have a horse standing by for Morant to escape, but Morant seems done with this planet. Take a boat and uh, see the world. I've seen it. Denny tells Witten that he's been sentenced to death. Just kidding, life. Like, he literally tells him death first Mm -hmm. and then says, oh, but someone changed it, so it's life now. Morant and Hancock are to be shot in the morning. I mean, to be fair... He is the least guilty out yeah. of right. all three of them. And he's the one who tried to stop them from doing all the terrible stuff right. that they're and now the being only, And the only one that he shot was in self-defense because right. he was being attacked. Exactly. Or at least that's the story that history maintains. Yeah. Although, was he part of the original firing squad when the prisoners were getting shot? No. 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 And he was advising against even forming right. that firing squad. Thomas heads to Kitchener's to argue for a stay of execution, but he's not home, conveniently, And so he speaks with Hamilton there. Hamilton explains that in the case of a tie in this courtroom, Denny gets a second vote. And so Denny said, fuck all these guys. Yeah. They're all going to die. Hamilton tells Thomas the good news that this likely means the end of the war. And coffins are being constructed just over the wall from where Morant and Hancock are being held. Hancock says, could have had the decency to measure us first. (laughs) And Morant says, don't suppose they've had many complaints. Hancock writes a first and last letter home. Morant writes a poem and hands it off to Thomas to see it published. As Witten is hauled out of his cell to be transferred, Morant and Hancock are shouting after him, Scapegoats of the Bloody Empire, which becomes the name of the novel that he will write. They have to apologize for that damn war, George. They're trying to end it now, so they need scapegoats! Harry! The scapegoats of the Bloody Empire! On the way to the firing squad, Morant is offered a padre to read him his last rites, but he says he's a pagan. Hancock asks what that means, and he says, it's somebody who doesn't believe there's a divine being dispensing justice to mankind. I'm a pagan too, then. (laughs) (laughs) Morant asks for an epitaph of Matthew 1036. Later, it's read from the Bible. And a man's soul shall be they of his own household. Morant and Hancock hold hands as they sit for their death sentence. I, I I was like, aw. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that's that's like wonderful and sad at and the a, same time. Apparently, the actors decided it on set. Like, just naturally, he put his hand out and the guy grabbed it. Mm-hmm. And then they found out later that during an interview happened. that that actually is how they went out. Those two yeah. guys were holding hands when they were shot. Were they also watching a beautiful sunset? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> but yes. But I don't know. Or was it sunrise? It was probably sunrise. I think it was sunrise. It was. Yeah. They got one extra day out of them. Morant's final poem is read out over the execution and ends with, If you encounter any boars, you really must not loot them. And if you wish to leave these shores, for pity's sake, don't shoot them. An on-screen epilogue explains that Witten was released after three years of his life sentence and returned to Australia to write the book Scapegoats of the Empire. And that's the end of our film. The writer-director here was Bruce Beersford. He also directed Driving Miss Daisy, 
which won Best Picture over Do the Right Thing, and Double Jeopardy. One of the writers, Jonathan Hardy, he played Labatouche in Mad Max earlier this year. Um, the other writer, David Stevens, also wrote the Sam Neill Merlin miniseries. <gasps> I Aww. love that one. Yeah. Uh, the playwright, Kenneth G. Ross, didn't have a lot of other credits, uh, and neither did the novelist, Kit Denton. Uh, story editor, Harold Lander, also not much. Edward Woodward was Harry Breaker Morant. He played Sergeant Howie in The Wicker Man. He's Tom Weaver in Hot Fuzz. And he plays the ghost of Christmas present in George C. Scott's Christmas Carol. Uh, George C. Scott didn't direct it, but he's the Scrooge in that. Right, right, right. Jack Thompson played Major J.F. Thomas, the attorney. He's Cleeg Lars, Darth Vader's stepdad in Episode 2, Attack mm -hmm. of the Clones. Uh, he's also a party guest in Short Circuit somewhere. He plays Ross Daly, Sean's father, in The Earthling who drives a camper off a cliff. And he has the same name as an American anti-violence video game protester. Who I don't hear much from anymore. Good. Terrence Donovan was Captain Hunt. He played Morant in the play that this film was adapted oh, from. There you go. Um, so he got the Hunt role here. Louis Fitzgerald played Lieutenant George Witten. This was his first film. And he seems very familiar to me. But the only other thing I'd seen from him was Pitch Black. Where he plays Paris P. Ogilvy. John Waters, not that John Waters, <laughs> played Captain Alfred Taylor here, and he has the same name as an American filmmaker. Brian Brown played Lieutenant Peter Hancock. He's Doug Coughlin in Cocktail. He's Roland Raleigh Tyler in FX and mm -hmm. FX2. Yeah. And apparently Sam Neill was on the shortlist to play this character, the Hancock character. I can see that. Yeah, it totally would have worked. Up or down, Richard? Um, I give this film an up. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh I completely agree uh, about your character descriptions of uh, of the just yeah it's 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 war and they could have made choices that they didn't make yeah uh, and you know and uh, it's they're not great people the situation they're in though is also not great yeah and I think it's a compelling story absolutely um, I uh, I know it's always kind of hard to to root for somebody when you don't really like them as a character. But uh, I feel that it, it kind of reminded me of uh, another courtroom style movie called uh, Hearts War, with Bruce Willis and yeah. Colin Farrell, um, where it's a very unlikable character played by Colin Farrell who's defending these two African-American soldiers in a German prison camp. Yeah. It, but it's a sham trial. And, uh, because of that, like, you know, you feel like the cards are stacked against him. So you kind of right. want, you want there to be not, not maybe ju not justice, justice is the word that I'm looking for, but you want there to be a victory. Is he uh, also a monster in that movie? Like he did terrible things. Uh, he did uh, the, in Hearts War, the terrible thing he did was he gave up uh, allied positions when he was being tortured, tortured. Or something? Oh, okay. but, but it wasn't, it, they, they, they reveal that. The person who was torturing him was the lowest level interrogator. Like he didn't even hold out for the highest level. Like they understand that he would eventually give <laughs> up, but the fact that he gave up on the very first attempt, that was the shame that he had. But uh, I did enjoy this movie. It's 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 going to be high up on my list. Uh, yeah. I can't believe I've never seen it. Yeah, I think we were excited about it because originally we had this earlier on the schedule for the year. Mm -hmm. And I think when we read the summary, we were like, oh, man, this sounds great. And then we're like, oh, no, it's not till October, though. Yeah. And we had to push it back. And, and I think we brought this point up maybe in the episode uh, of MacGyver with, uh, I think it was, I think it's called Escape or The Escape with John Delancey. Yeah. Uh, and because at the end, it ends with an arms deal. And MacGyver saying most of this stuff dates back, dates back to the Boer, Boer War. War yeah. And I was like. Now, in having a more context, it's like, really? Like, he was selling weapons <laughs> 80 from years old. that long ago? Yeah. Uh, so I just thought that was a funny thing, too, about this movie. <laughs> Jess, what do you think, up or down on this one? Um, I gave it up. Uh, I actually really liked this movie. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we're not too keen on the idea that, you know, they're they're guilty and, and, and the entire movie we spend trying to be sympathetic to them. Yeah. But overall, I liked the movie. I think it was well written. It was engaging the whole time. I liked the acting. Um, so overall, I definitely give it an up. Yep. Uh, yeah, for me, it's definitely an up. Um, I enjoyed this movie, even though 
like they're not uh, like i said they're not the most defensible characters i don't think the script is necessarily expecting you to 100 percent sympathize with them. right right i think that's the point of the witten character is for you to have someone to identify with that's the whole time telling them no don't do this mm-hmm. what you're doing is terrible um and that eventually it caught up to them but um i liked it a lot letterbox what are you thinking uh, i got this at uh, number 16 okay uh, made my top 20 this puts it just below little darlings and just above caddyshack all right okay so i actually put it in 10th place oh wow for the year um because i think it was it was good it's um you know it's not too far from my other australian favorite for the year it's it's too above my brilliant career it's just below caddyshack and just above uh night of the juggler okay cool i don't have it quite that high um i have it in 37th place uh, it's just below Brubaker, which I felt like it reminds me a lot of Brubaker in mm-hmm. places. Um, but it's and it's just above Mountain Men, so that's where I had it. I think that's about everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Where, as I said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintagevideopodcast. Because this is our first episode of the month again, I wanted to remind our listeners about our Patreon campaign for anyone who hasn't had time to check it out. Vintage Video will always be free to listen to, but if it's worth it to you, a donation as small as a buck a month is greatly appreciated. We are into October now. We've been doing the show for nine months. This is our 117th episode. We're averaging close to 13 titles a month and expect to cover 14 a month on average over the course of the year, which means that for the buck a month tier, you're donating seven or eight cents an episode. We also offer a $5 tier, about 36 cents per film, which includes a shout out on the show, a monthly exclusive episode reviewing a title from the 70s, and a hand in choosing each month's 70s review. We've recorded nine so far, and for October, our second tier members are choosing between six titles. Dirty Dingus McGee, a comedic anti-Western starring Frank Sinatra as the title outlaw and George Kennedy as the sheriff on his trail. The Owl and the Pussycat, a romantic comedy starring Barbara Streisand and George Seagal, directed by Nijinsky director Herbert Ross. Perfect Friday, a British bank heist film starring Ursula Andress, Stanley Baker, and David Warner. Ryan's Daughter, David Lean's epic romantic drama starring Robert Mitchum, Sarah Miles, and Leo McKern. Scrooge, a musical adaptation of Dickens' A Christmas Carol starring Albert Phineas Scrooge and Alec Guinness as Jacob Marley from Hopscotch director Ronald Neem. And Phantom Tollbooth, a mixed live-action animation children's fantasy film directed by Chuck Jones and starring Butch Patrick, Mel Blanc, June Foray, and Hans Conried, the voice of captain hook who we just had as a doctor in oh god book two each of which will be celebrating their 50th anniversaries this november if this sounds like something you'd be interested in you can find our campaign at patreon.com slash vintage video podcast if not i hope you'll at least do us the honor of continuing to listen and on that note we have a special announcement we got one we have a new five dollar patron mt thank you so much for your contribution to the show as a new patron, you've unlocked 10 episodes of our Patreon reviews. Um, I think nine, and then Trog this month will be the 10th because Trog. you provided our tiebreaker vote. So yeah. Trog is coming at you, I think the 21st or the 24th of the month, somewhere later this month. But we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a good <laughs> one. So thanks again, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Gloria, which IMDb describes like so. When a young boy's family is killed by the mob, their tough neighbor Gloria becomes his reluctant guardian. We leave you now with the trailer for Gloria. Jenna Rollins is Gloria. She's tough, but she sides with the little guy. I don't want to die. What do I do with you? You know, you're not my family or anything. You're, you're, you're just a neighbor's kid, right? Gloria. You know, we're not interested in you. All we want is the book and the kid. What are you going to do? Shoot a six-year-old kid on the street? Go.
warrior, the danger is always getting closer. And getting closer is always the danger. Tony? Gloria? How are you? Can you help me? Gloria, trust me. Maybe we can do something. Trust you? Hey, Tony, I know you. Where is the boy? I don't want to go home. Hey, don't be stupid. You got no home. You got me. I understand. You are a woman. He is a little boy. You fall in love. Every woman is a mother. You love him. I love Phil. Do you love me? How can I resist you? Hey, I don't like this kid. We need the boy. I'm gonna get up and walk out of here now. If you want to stop, you can. Like Cagney and Bogey and all those great tough guys. Now there is Gloria, a chick off the old block. Come on, come on. Oh, I'd love it. Come on. Don't hang back. I'd love it. I got a six-year-old kid over there that had his whole family murdered by you punks. Go ahead, Trun. OK? You little woman, bitch, huh? You little tiny nothing. General is Gloria. She's trying to beat the mob at their own game. Hi everyone, I'm Nick, the host and founder of the show The St. Paul Filmcast. I'm also an independent comic book writer and illustrator. And on films, I do storyboard art, and I'm a production assistant. Listen to my show, the St. Paul Filmcast, when I interview directors, actresses and actresses, editors, cinematographers, sound mixers, makeup artists, and producers of independent films from the Twin Cities area. We will also have filmmakers from outstate, around the United States, and international. Oh, and we'll have occasionally other guests, podcasters, and novelists who talk about their favorite films as well. It's the St. Paul Filmcast, where you can find an iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Podbean, and Amazon Radio. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram. It's the St. Paul Filmcast, where it's never over till the guests say it's over. 